So I thought I'd just start by clarifying that in this work, we haven't actually broken a 128-bit secure um, elliptic curve discrete log problem. So sorry to disappoint anyone if, that, if the title gave that impression. This talk is really about um, the discrete log problem in finite fields and small characteristic as they arise from pairings on super singular uh, binary curves. So a quick outline of the talk, just give some background and motivation on this problem. I'll then talk about our contributions. I'm gonna finish off with a, a recent result of ours, which was not in, the, um, well, it's not in this paper, but actually did, kind of um, grew naturally from the, the techniques in this paper. So hopefully that will be interesting and, uh, and relevant. So what are super singular curves? Well, a super singular binary, uh, sorry, elliptic curve is just one, um, if it's in characteristic P, it has no points of order P over an algebraic closure. And more generally, a super singular um, curve of higher genus is just one whose Jacobian is um, isogenous to product of super singular elliptic curves. And here's a couple of examples here over F2, so E0 and E1. And it's a basic property of super singular curves, or these two in particular, that for any odd uh, prime P, if we consider the, the curve over F2 to the P, then the group orders are just given by these expressions here. So the history of super singular curves in cryptography is quite an interesting one. And back in the early days of ECC, point count and algorithms were not as efficient as they are today. And so having a group order given explicitly like this made them very attractive for um, early adopters of ECC. However, around uh, 1993, thanks to Menezes, Okamoto, and Vanstone, um, they realized that one can take an elliptic curve DLP and map it via repairing to um, a finite field DLP and an extension of the base field um, over which the elliptic curve is defined. And they also knew that super singular curves have low embedding degree. And as a result, um, the first lesson for the crypto community regarding the use of these curves was that they are bad. And just to give an example, um, for this E0 and E1, they have embedding degree four, and so you have an easy attack. Well, not necessarily easy, but you have an attack which is sub-exponential. And so these curves fell out of fashion for about seven years until um, a series of very nice results, starting with uh, papers by Zhu, Bonnet Franklin, and um, Sakai, Gishin, and Kasahara. And they realized that well, there are many um, constructive applications of parents in cryptography. And it was reasoned that, well, OK, you may have an attack in the embedding field of a curve, but as long as uh, the DLP in this field is still hard, then this is an acceptable state of affairs. And so the second lesson to take from the history of these curves is basically, provided the applications are good enough, and we can safely ignore lesson one. And so lots of, uh, lots of implementers spend a lot of time, myself included, uh, making these curves and pairings over these curves as efficient as, as possible. And uh, it's not only elliptic curves, but also super singular hyperliptic curves. And as proposed, of super singular abelian varieties um, due to Alice and Carl Rubin. And so there's really a lot of work went into this. However, um, last year, this was all thrown into uh, complete turmoil, I guess thanks to a series of um, high-impact results. And before I describe these, I should just mention that the, uh, the DLP computation basically uses an algorithm known as index calculus, which consists of two parts. So you have a first part, which is to define a factor space, and one attempts to, to generate relations between these elements, and then find their logs. And the second part is to take an arbitrary element in the field, and then attempt to write it as a product of elements of smaller and smaller degree until all of these elements in the product are in the factor space. This is known as the descent. And previously, these two stages were both sub-exponential time. So the first result um, was in February last year, which was uh, by myself and three colleagues at University College Dublin, namely Furu Galoglu, Gary Maguire, and Jensen Bregel. And what we showed is that the first stage in index calculus can actually be done in polynomial time. And also, the hardest part during the descent, which is the elimination of uh, degree two elements, that could also be done in polynomial time. And at around the same time, Antoine Ju was having very similar ideas. So he came up with a polynomial time relation generation method for degree one elements, which was different to ours, but essentially isomorphic to it. And he also had a polynomial time method for eliminating degree two elements, which was uh, in batches, so it's slightly different to ours. But most importantly, he had a, a descent method for eliminating other small degree elements, which are the hardest part during the descent after degree two. And with this, he was able to get a heuristic L of one fourth algorithm. So that was a really big breakthrough. And then a couple of months after that, um, we have the quasi polynomial algorithm due to Barbalescu, uh, Gauji, Ju, and Tome. And here, the descent they showed um, is, is quasi polynomial, an even bigger breakthrough. 
And as a result of this, uh, the third lesson for the use of super singular curves in crypto is that small characteristic super singular curves really are bad for cryptography. And I think Stephen Galbraith wrote in his blog, type one pairings are dead. So quite dramatic. But uh, that was the way it was. And furthermore, um, there's a lot of DLP records set last year uh, which support the validity of these theoretical advances. So they're not just uh, purely theoretical. And the last one of these was actually set by um, the, the team behind this paper, which is um, in a 9,000-bit field. So this raises an obvious question, which is, uh, if the small characteristic field DLP is dead, then why should anybody bother studying it? And I guess just to extend the metaphor a little bit, um, the short answer is that, yes, it may be dead, but it's not quite buried. So I guess a slightly longer answer um, is deserved. So the first point I would say is that all the records I just showed you, well, none of them actually arise, or were, were attacking fields which arise from parameters in the cryptographic literature. So it kind of seemed mad to have all these new tools and algorithms and technology, to have all these parameters in the literature, and yet to declare everything dead without actually trying to attack a single one of them. So that was the first motivation. Um, a second one is that all the DLP records I showed you use very special extension degrees, namely those which permit a, a Kuma extension or a twisted Kuma extension. And these are actually the easiest, break, easiest to break relative to fields of the same bit length. And um, that's because you can reduce the size of the factor base and also the descent becomes easier. So this leaves another question, which is how hard are the DLPs in the literature? And uh, actually another team of researchers studied this very question. And when we looked at their paper, we realized there is uh, certain inefficiencies in their analysis um, that we could significantly improve upon. So that was a real uh, motivation for this, this paper. And the final one is a bit of a kind of a meta consideration for this type of work, which is that sometimes if you study a particular problem instance, you can actually gain theoretical insights, which you wouldn't have otherwise just by thinking about things purely in the abstract. And so I'll give an example of that at the end of the, uh, the talk. So the team I just mentioned who looked at this first was um, Adj, Menezes, Olivier, and Rodriguez Enriquez. And what they did was to take the, the techniques from Jus L one fourth paper and the quasi-polynomial paper and analyze the concrete security of several DLP um, examples which arise from the pairing-based literature, which were thought to be or were designed to be 128 bits secure. So concrete security just means you take all the different algorithms which you need to perform the, the computation, you implement them, and then you don't bother running them. And the reason you don't run them is because it would simply take too long to do. So you just invoke several standard heuristics. And with that, you can get an estimate of how difficult it is to solve a given DLP. So they looked at three fields in this paper. The first one um, is from the elliptic curve over F3 to the 509, which has embedded degree 6. And what they showed is rather than 128 bits of security um, using these techniques, it only has about 74 bits of security. And the unit of cost they use is this MR, so it's a bit of a fuzzy notion of bit security. But MR is just the cost of performing a one modular multiplication modulo the, the subgroup order of the elliptic curve in question. And the second one they looked at is this middle one here. This is, so a, this is a genus two um, hyperelliptic curve over F2 to the 367. This has embedded degree 12. And again, rather than, that's not part of the talk. And rather than 128 bits of security, it only has about 95 bits of security. And the final one there, um, it's an elliptic curve over F2 to the 1223, which has embedded degree four. And interestingly, they concluded that all of the techniques do not reduce the security. So it, it's still apparently 128 bits secure. And uh, you know this, this is perfectly feasible because these new techniques are asymptotically um, superior to the original L, L of one third function field sieve, um, we don't actually know the crossover. So this could still be secure. Maybe people would still like to use it. I wouldn't recommend that. But um, there were several inefficiencies in their analysis. Um, one I'll just point out here. So you'll notice that each of these cases um, uses a k equals two. This just means there's a quadratic extension of the target field. And the reason they do this is because you need to take an extension of degree at least two in order to get the the relations between the factor base elements. Um, but what they then did was assume that the target discrete log is actually uh, in the, um, 
in this quadratic extension, which it's not. So they're instantly trying to solve a problem which is in a field twice as big as it should be. So that was just one uh, inefficiency, I guess. So we looked at this and we came up with a few um, observations and uh, techniques and principles. And basically, our contribution in this paper is to give you know, a plan to follow if you want to attack a given DLP. And we're not saying these are the, the optimal ones, but they're certainly better than the ones that were there before. So the first one is that uh, if you look at the classical descent and the Elevon fourth descent, a basic property is that if you use a smaller queue in your field representation, then you get a faster descent. And if you use the original um, field representation, which basically means finding a, yeah, that's not working. Um, you just have to find an H0 and an H1, which are defined over FQ to the K. So this, this first polynomial here, um, H1 of X times X to the Q minus H0 of X, has an irreducible degree N factor. And so you need to choose a Q larger than N in order to represent such a field. What we did is just choose a slightly subtly uh, different polynomial, so we just bring the Q to the inside. This polynomial then has degree Q times the degree of H1. And so if we want to represent a field of degree N, we can just choose the degree of the HIs to be greater than two, such that we get a Q which gives us a smaller descent. So that's what we did. Um, the second thing we proposed is something called a principle of parsimony, which basically means do the minimum amount of work you can in order to solve the problem. So in particular, the descent should always take place in the target field. You should use this quadratic extension or cubic extension. And only when you can't work in the um, target field, for instance, when you're trying to solve the logs of the factor base elements, then you should take an extension of the base field. So that's necessary in some circumstances, but you shouldn't do it if, if you don't have to. So the third thing is the observation that if you do have to extend the, uh, the base field in order to get the factor base logs, then actually you can use this to reduce the cost of the descent. So if you have a, a quadratic extension, for instance, then during the descent, if you have an irreducible element of even degree, at any time you like, you can just factorize it over the quadratic extension, thereby halving the degree automatically. So that speeds up, and we use this judiciously during our descents and our estimates. And finally, um, it's actually possible to get the factor-based logs without taking the extension at all, just using k equals 1. And this also means that we can use the element fourth techniques to eliminate elements of a higher degree than previously. And as a result, we didn't actually need to use any parts of the quasi-polynomial algorithm at all, which is asymptotically very efficient, but it's not um, actually necessary in this case. So as a result, what we showed is that in this uh, elliptic curve over F2 to the 1223, which the previous um, team of researchers thought had still had 128 bits of security, actually only has 59 bits. And in this Junus 2 hyperelliptic curve over F2 to the 367, rather than 95 bits of security, we show that it only has about 48 bits of security. And the time on the right there is actually the time um, required to solve the, a discrete log problem. And we did that in practice. So let's give a couple of details here. Um, so this is the genus 2 hyperelliptic curve, super singular. We take uh, this representation for the degree 367 extension. So notice we're using the alternate polynomial here, where q is 2 to the 6 rather than 2 to the 12, which makes the descent much faster. And I guess the most interesting thing um, in, this, in this solution of the DLP was the small degree elimination. So here's a flow chart um, which tells you exactly how we eliminated elements, irreducible elements of a given degree over F212 on the, the bottom row and over F224 when we needed to on the top row. So I won't explain all this in, uh, in all its detail, but I'll just point out a couple of things. So if um, you have a degree one element over F212, but we can just lift this to a degree one element over F224, which is where we solve the factor-based logs. So those logs are automatically known. If we have a degree two element, this is irreducible over F212. If we just factorize it over F224, again, this splits, so we have the logs of those elements as well. And we can perform the same trick for degree four to degree two. We just factor over the extension. And we could do it for six to three, but we didn't there because we found it faster to descend along the bottom row. For eight, we just go straight to four and then we can descend along the top row. So there's lots of um, kind of nice tricks to get everything, and all of these probabilities um, kind of balanced out, and it's all very nice. So we ended up solving this in about 52,000 core hours. And uh, I should just mention, a couple of days before we did this, before we announced this, the team of Agitale solved um, the first instance 
of a DLP arising from um, uh, parameters in the literature, but it was only for a 1303-bit field. So it was more of a, a proof of concept than really trying to attack something which was meant to be 128-bit secure. So I wanted to mention um, a recent result of ours, which really grew from that small degree elimination flowchart I just showed you. So assume we're going to try and solve a discrete log problem in, F, in a field FQ to the KN. We consider this as a degree N extension of FQ to the K. And we only have two tools available. Um, the first one, we'll assume, is the polynomial time algorithm for finding the logs of the degree one elements. So assume that's done. That was in our crypto paper and also Antoine Jus' paper. And the second thing is to assume we can take a degree two element and uh, we can eliminate it, which basically means writing it as a product of degree one elements in polynomial time, which is also in our crypto paper. And that's all we're going to do. So let's assume we have a degree four element. Well, how are we going to eliminate this? Well, what we can do is use the trick from the previous um, slide. So we just take a degree two, and two extension. This gives us a product of two degree um, two irreducibles. We can then apply the polynomial time elimination from degree two to degree one. But we don't know the logs of the degree one elements over the quadratic extension. So what do we do? We just take a norm back down to the original subfield. So the degree two we just eliminated over the quadratic extension. When we apply the norm gives us the original degree four. And then the degree ones, they give us either degree twos or the square of a degree one. So then we apply the degree two to one elimination again. We end up expressing the degree four irreducible as a product of Q squared degree one irreducibles. And we can do the same trick for an irreducible of degree eight. We take a degree four extension, we apply the elimination from degree two to degree one, we take the norm back down to the quadratic subfield, we tick tack our way back down until we get an expression in terms of, uh, well, you have Q cubed degree one elements um, expressed in the degree eight irreducible. The same thing for 16, and any power of two we like, we can just go up and then just tick tack our way back down eliminating taken norms, eliminating the taken norms. So we end up um, expressing any irreducible of degree two to the E as a product of Q to the E um, degree ones. So this is a quasi-polynomial algorithm, and it's, um, it's completely different to the one um, from Barbalescu et al. Um, the problem is it only applies to elements of irreducible elements of degree of power of two, but we can do this for any element just by taking a random multiple of the field defined in polynomial such that, and we add it to the target element, such that this has degree um, two to the e, and we choose two to the e to be greater than four n, such that we can uh, apply a theorem due to one on, um, it's a Dirichlet type theorem on primes and arithmetic progressions. Then we get an irreducible element and we can apply this descent. And so we get a new uh, QPA and fixed characteristic. And interestingly, because this method, this descent method is very algebraic, um, we can actually argue that it requires, relies on no heuristics whatsoever. Soon, as soon as we have a field representation where the degree of HIs is at most two, then this works. And so we get a theorem. Uh, I've run out of time, but I'll quickly say it. So for all primes P, there exists infinitely many extensions, FP to the N, for which the DLP in this field can be solved in quasi-polynomial time. And this is the, uh, the preprint, which will be available very soon. And thanks for your attention.